a few moments, let us meditate together on these passages of Scripture. The 11th chapter of the book of Proverbs, the 30th verse. The first chapter of the book of Acts, verse 8. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. But you shall receive power, Acts 1 and 8, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. For a few moments, let us reason together from this subject, lay persons harnessing the power of the Holy Spirit. Will you say that with me? Lay persons harnessing the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on and say it again. Lay persons harnessing the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thanks be to God for the investment that God makes in lay persons. Why is it that we would have a Sunday that celebrates the laity? Well, my beloved brothers and sisters, there should never be any sense of competition or intimidation between those of the ecclesiastical orders, the diaconate, and lay persons. The fact of the matter is we are all on the same team. And because we're all on the same team, whatever God is doing in your life, I believe that each one should be happy for what God is doing in someone else's life. Now, it takes a big person to do that. It takes a mature person, someone who's anchored in their faith, to celebrate the gifts that God places in others. For there are so many spirits that come to church beside the Holy Spirit. We believe in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the power of the Holy Ghost. But remember that the Holy Ghost is not the only ghost in the house. There are some other ghosts. And there are some other spirits. And that's why I thank God that the Holy Ghost, as a part of the Trinity, is in that all power domain because when you are confronted with other spirits you better have more power than the other spirits because this is a spiritual world and everywhere that we go we encounter spirits spirits are territorial they are spirits that act like they own certain areas in fact some spirits almost dare you to show up and that's why you have to go in the power of Jesus name don't ever think that you can go forth in ministry on your own because there are spirits out there, I'm talking about low-down, cutthroat, killer spirits that want to take you out. But when you got a fence all the way around you, when you have God's God and angels around you, the enemy might want to destroy you, but God will preserve your life. Come on, help me give God some praise. Yes, you must confront other spirits. For even when Jeremiah was called by God as a layperson, and remember, nobody is born with a certificate of ordination. You get a birth certificate, but not an ordination certificate. You get a birth certificate, but not a license when you were born, which means you have to go through that process 
of laity. You got to go through faith development. You have to be trained and anchored in God's purpose and will. You don't get anywhere in God's kingdom instantly. God has no instant wonders, no overnight successes, but it's worth it for you to give your whole life to God. He's worth it for you to give him the best of your service. And inasmuch as God has predestinated us in him before the foundation of the world, he gives you grace when you go into territory that is claimed by other spirits. Because the first thing is going to happen to you when you get into other spirits' territory is they're going to try to look you to death. And if looks could kill, you'd be falling out right now. And that's why God told Jeremiah, be not afraid of their faces. And you got to learn that if you don't have enough strength, enough reinforcement yet to look that demon in the face, then look at Jesus until your cup runs over. And after he renews and reinforces you, you can look at any demon. God will make your face like a flint. God will back you up. God will give you grace in your spirit to remind you the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? God has not given us the spirit of fear but of love, power, and a sound mind. Don't let the enemy's intimidating tactics drive you crazy. God has blessed you with good common sense. And in addition to that, he's given you revelation knowledge, which is wisdom beyond your years. It's not you or I that's speaking anyway. It's God in us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Come on, help me give God some praise here today. And so then, it is right for us to celebrate, to elevate lay persons. Now, you may not be able to say amen to that yet. Just say, hmm. So why should we celebrate lay persons? According to Isaiah chapter 40, the playing field has been leveled. And because God has seen fit through Christ to level the playing field, every mountain and hill has been made low. Every valley has been exalted. The crooked has been made straight. Rough places have been made plain. The glory of God is being revealed and all humanity can see it together. Because the playing field has been leveled when Jesus defeated sin, death, hell, and the grave, that means there are no more big eyes and little U's. Because the playing field has been leveled, that means nobody is better than anybody else. I'm a bishop, but I'm not better than you. In fact, I, along with you, have an equal footing at God's throne. God won't answer me any faster than you when it comes to calling on the name of Jesus because look at him leveling the praying field. He didn't say whatever bishop calls me. He didn't say whatever pastor calls me, whatever missionary, whatever evangelist, but he said, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be what? Come on, help me give God praise. Let's deal with it today. Come on, let's deal with some real truth. Judgment must begin at the house of God. God is not pleased with an legalistic atmosphere where people are made to feel as though they are less than human simply because they don't hold a title or a position. And whenever you make people feel like they are nothing and you strutting around with your nose in the air, be careful because you got to stand before a just God. And he must have leveled the playing field because he ain't going to call none of us reverend, doctor, bishop, pastor, 
Well done, thou good and faithful what? Servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I'll make you rule over many. That's why we celebrate layperson because God leveled the playing field. It's a good thing to know your Bible, isn't it? And since God leveled it, we do have some investment in that notion of the priesthood of all believers because we had to do it for the past 18 months. Every time we had a communion for the past 18 months on the first Sunday, you didn't have no bishop in your house. You didn't have a pastor, an elder, or deacon to pass you a tray. You had to level that praying field and bless your own grape juice or water or whatever substance you had consecrate your own bread as the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and then commune in your house because Jesus is Lord in your house come on help me give God some praise yes God leveled the playing field that's why Isaiah has to celebrate the ministry of that iconoclastic preacher with a bulldozer ministry. The reason why God gave him the ministry of a bulldozer because a highway had to come through there. You can't build a highway unless you knock down some mountains and drain some swamps. You can't build a highway unless you're able to do enough surveying to help you if necessary to tunnel through mountains. Anybody driven west before? You, you got to go through some tunnels if you pay on I-76. Now, I have saved me $40 before and taken 476 up to 80 uh, But every now and then, you want to take 76 And you got some tunnels, uh, Allegheny and Kittatinny and uh, hello. <laughs> You look like you've been traveling there, but now I hear you. You got to have a powerful ministry to blast your way through mountains, to put a highway there. And God recognizes that in order for the kingdom to be established, there are times when leveling the playing field means that God has to get physical with the devil. And when that happens, you know, ministry is a contact sport. And that is why Jesus says, prepare me a body. I can't stay in heaven and save humanity remote control. I can't have a Zoom call and die for people's sins. I've got to show up in person. I gotta give you some hands to be nailed. I gotta give you some feet to drive a spike into. I gotta give you a head to be crowned with thorns. I gotta give you a side to be pierced with a spear. Jesus had to engage the enemy face to face. Not only does he engage him, but it's a gang fight. It's a slugfest. And the enemy took everything that he had and threw it at Jesus. Jesus not only engages in spiritual and supernatural warfare against the enemy, but Jesus can take a hit. As the saying is, he took a licking and kept on ticking. Anytime you keep going and you've been body slammed, you can keep ministering and holes all in your body. You can keep praying and part of your brain is oozing through cracks in your head. You better have some God in you. God will give you strength. God will give you grace. His grace is sufficient for me. His strength is perfected in my weakness. Say yes. Ministry is a contact sport. I know you feel me because some of us may have already programmed our DVRs for the game that's going to be on later today. And you haven't been able to see that kind of activity for months, but for some reason, there's just something about it when you see a man 
running into another linebacker to make way for that pass to come through or for that ball to get in the air. Well, that's what God has to do for you. As you walk by faith and not by sight, do you realize what all God has to do for you in order for you to not only survive but thrive in a wicked world? Don't you understand that God knows you live in a place where bullets with no name on them are flying? He knows gang warfare is in the area. He knows that there are thieves and robbers and murderers and killers. But do they know that the angel of the Lord encamps about them that fear him? Do they know that they that be with us are more than the demons that be with them? If God be for us, who can be against? us. That's why God gives you confidence. You don't have to walk around wondering what's going to happen to you. You don't have to walk around fearful about your future. You hold your head up and square your soul. Walk on by faith because God is not only in you, he's with you, he's over you, he's all around you. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Come on, help me praise God up in here today. Yes, my brothers and sisters, the playing field is leveled. Well then, if that is the case, what do we need with ecclesiastical authority? What do we need with the diaconate? Well, my purpose is not to be anti-lay person, rather to empower lay people. This is what Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, because since I got the power, power should not go to my head that I don't want to share it with anyone else. I shouldn't be so stuck on the fact that I've got some power that I'm intimidated to let anybody else get involved in advancing the kingdom. Power is not to be consolidated or monopolized. Power is to be shared. After Jesus says, all power of heaven and earth is given unto me, what does he say in Acts 1 and 8? And you shall receive power, which means I'm getting ready to share my power with you. Now, that's a real servant leader. Because in order to share your power means you, first of all, got to respect the person you sharing the power with. And then it means you got to trust the person you are sharing the power with. And then it means you got to actually love the person you are sharing the power with. You ain't sharing power with somebody you can't even speak to. Are you going to share power with me and you see me coming and walk in the other direction? You full of hell. That's your problem. You have to have a relationship in Christ in order to share the power. That's why God gives us grace to build solid, wholesome relationships. That's why Jesus invested in teaching lay person. You do realize Jesus never called a priest to be one of his 12 apostles. Hello? You notice he didn't call any scribes and Pharisees to be one of the 12. You notice he didn't go to the Sanhedrin council and ask for nobody. Why didn't Jesus bother with asking the Sanhedrin? Nicodemus was a member. He didn't ask Nicodemus to be an apostle. What he did do was put him back in kindergarten. And you know, you, you got to have a whole lot of grace and patience with God. When you come up in here thinking you know everything, God said, well, you just right for kindergarten. <laughs> Coming up here talking about, I'm a member of the Sanhedrin. That's why I didn't come up here in the daytime, because I don't want nobody to see me associated with you. And Jesus said, well, let me go and put you in kindergarten. You must be born. 
born. You don't know nothing yet. Except a man be born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. And you've been on the Sanhedrin and never seen God's kingdom. You got position, title, and authority and have never even seen God's kingdom because you've never experienced God's presence. What is the kingdom? The kingdom is not meat and drink. The kingdom is not position, title, and authority. The kingdom is righteousness, joy, and peace. Where? In the Holy Ghost. Nicodemus, come on to kindergarten. Get you a Holy Ghost experience. Get a born again experience. Get a regeneration experience. And then I can use you in the kingdom. Oh, yeah, you may not be able to shout on this sermon. <laughs> this ain't no Mac sermon. This is a meat and potatoes, greens and cornbread kind of sermon. So then God anoints those of us in the ecclesiastical construct, in the diaconate, in order to serve those who are laity. The Bible warns us, do not lord yourself over them. Don't act like you own them because God will mess you up if you tamper with his church. He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. It ain't yours. You didn't die for it. You didn't go to hell for it. You didn't rise from the dead for it. So stop putting your chest up to my, this mine. If God hadn't risen Christ from the dead, you wouldn't have a gospel to preach. Wouldn't even have a song to sing. Be careful about the spirit of pride. Pride goeth before destruction. And a haughty, stuck up, nose in the air, ungodly spirit goeth before fall. And that's why when the Holy Ghost comes, he has to level the playing field. He has to check pride. He has to check exalted attitudes. Has to check spirits of manipulation and control. Because God can't move upon his people as long as those strongholds are trying to control God's kingdom. That is why Jesus literally had to do battle in the spirit. Jesus had to engage in a supernatural confrontation. He had to defeat the powers of hell. He had to defeat sin and death. I'm not talking about draw. I'm not talking about a standstill, a stalemate. I'm not talking about a tie. Jesus had to stomp the devil's head. He had to take the sting of death and the victory of the grave and then declare it all. Power is mine, but not so that I can say I got all power. The reason why the Father entrusted Christ with the power is so that He could entrust us with the Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad God trusts you enough to give you the secrets of His Word? Aren't you glad God trusts you enough to give you the Holy Ghost? Aren't you glad God trusts you enough to give you kingdom authority? Come on, help me give God some praise here today. The playing field is leveled. There was a time when if you were going to be involved in this kind of ministry, you had to be born in the right tribe. You had to be a Levite. Levites are the one that took care of those priestly responsibilities. Levites put that robe on, and from among them you have the chief priest, the high priest. But Jesus is above all of that. When Jesus died on the cross, he did something that no high priest or chief priests could do. For once a year they would go into the Holy of Holies to offer the sin offering, the atonement for the people. But Jesus doesn't have to do it every year, once and for all. Jesus one time has entered into the veil. Jesus one time has suffered at the just 
for the unjust, the holy, for the unholy. Jesus one time has taken upon him the sins of the whole world, past, present, and future. He had a right to say, it is finished. I've done the job. Satan is a defeated foe. The kingdom is in order. It's finished. And because he leveled that playing field, he then brought the laypersons together. I've been with you for three and a half years. I've taught you and I've walked before you, demonstrated the miraculous power of the kingdom. Now I'm ready to release you, but I can't do it until you go to the upper room. You got to tap into some power you never dreamed possible before. It's not enough for you to have been with me in advanced theological training for three and a half years. You're not ready for graduation until you go into the upper room. You've got to have a Holy Ghost experience. Let me hear somebody say, you got to have a Holy Ghost experience. That means that you have to have a relationship with the person who is the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about it. The Holy Ghost is not an it. The Holy Ghost is a person with feelings, with emotions, which is why Ephesians 4.30 says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Ghost is actually closer to you because God the Father, Yahweh, was not a user-friendly personality. In fact, the proper way to spell it is to leave the vowels out, Y-H-W-H, which leaves you with the name of God you can't even say. And that's exactly what God intended because he didn't want you saying his name so that you wouldn't run the risk of taking his name in vain. Now, it's hard to take a name in vain you can't even pronounce. The Lord said, I'll fix you. I'll give you my name and ain't a vowel in it nowhere. So all you can do is look at it and think about it, but you can't say it because there are aspects about my character that are beyond human utterance. But then God sends Jesus. He wraps himself up in human form. And then God becomes user-friendly. Never before could humanity go up and touch God. You don't even touch the ark. David found that out. He was going to flatbed the ark back to Jerusalem because where it was, people were being blessed and delivered. He said, I want to bring it back home. But he had to realize you are a lay person. And even though you are the king, you can't touch that off because you have not entered into the new dispensation of grace. As long as you're under the old dispensation, you let the priests take the ark and put those poles through those brazen ring and raise it up above their shoulders and rest it on them. They're the ones that take the ark of the covenant. But now that God has become user friendly, I I can call his name any time and any place. In the name of Jesus, I have the victory. Jesus in the morning. Jesus in the noonday. Jesus when the sun go down. Jesus in the midnight hour. Jesus, my sanctifier. Jesus, my sin forgiver. Jesus, my Holy Ghost. Somebody help me say Jesus. In order for the playing field to be leveled, God had to put the kingdom under new management. And since it is under new management, that means you're going to have to change the name of the whole operation. So then you don't need to bother Jehovah anymore because Jehovah ain't managing this. Mm. You know, I realize those compound names, Jehovah, Rohi, the Lord, our shepherd, Jehovah, Sitkin, the Lord, our righteousness, Jehovah, Mekadishkim, the Lord, our sanctified, Jehovah, Nisi, the Lord, 
our banner, Elohim, the God who creates everything. Yahweh, that self-existent, pre-existent human or divine being. But the fact of the matter is, God took all the Jehovah's and put them out of business. And what was left of them, he poured them into the name Jesus. So if you're wondering what happened to Jehovah, where is Sitkanu, Mekadishkam, Rohai, where is Shalom, where are all these names that I used to call, where well, those names have been incorporated into the name Jesus. For God has given him a name above every name. Jesus is above Jehovah. Jesus is above Yahweh. Jesus is above Elohim. Jesus is above Rohai, Sitkanu, Mekadishkam, Nisi. The name Jesus is above every name. For when we see him, we're not going to bow at the name Jehovah. But at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And the devil knows this. If you don't believe it, find you somebody demon-possessed. And say, in the name of Jehovah, I cast you out. You know, that's been tried before. The sons of Siva found a man demon-possessed. Now, they didn't even know Jesus, had never even met Jesus, never even confessed Jesus, never even been converted. They were engaging in copyright infringement. They saw the apostles do it, and they said, we can do it too. Some people don't know where we get hand clapping from. Some people don't know where we get foot stomping from. Some people don't know where we get praising him in the dance from. Some people don't know where we get speaking in tongues from. Laying hands on the sick. Oh, Lord. See, everybody now wants a praise team, a dance ministry, a tambourine, a set of drums. Everybody now is clapping their hands. But don't you remember when we started out giving God Pentecostal praise? People in silk stockings and starch shirts called us holy rollers and called us goody two-shoes and said the sanctified church over across the tracks, they made fun of us and said we're playing tin pans and beating drums, but the power of the Holy Ghost was so great that God began emptying the churches, silk stocking cathedral, starch shirt cathedral, bourgeois temple, because there wasn't no power there. Sitting up there, stuck up, had fine cars, fine homes, degrees, but no God, no joy, no healing, no demons being cast out, no burdens being lifted, no sins being forgiven. So God, raise up some laypersons. Mm, thank God for laypersons. He found a man by the name of W.J. Seymour who uh, was described as a pigeon toad, not neat preacher who lost an eye to smallpox. In fact, he grew a beard to hide the scars on his face. He was a seeker for the Holy Ghost, but he went to a church that didn't allow black people in there. Went to a school, said, you can't come in here. You the wrong color. So while Parham was telling Seymour, God 
don't want you in here. You can't even hear about the gift of the Holy Ghost. Seymour sat by the side of the door. Lean. I just want to hear about the Holy Ghost. I just want to hear about the power that set the captives free. I just want to know about Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Say yes. Say yes. I'm so glad God got a lay person named W.J. Seymour. Look at here, Seymour. Stay there. Even if they put you out, stay there. On your knees, stay there. God will open the door. No man can shut. God will open a way for you. God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Say yes. Say yes. Hallelujah. Sometimes you got to move. Oh, Lord. I said sometimes you got to move. He was in Houston, Texas, where Parham wouldn't let him in the door. But God said, Seymour, I'm going to make a way for you to go out in the Los Angeles. And here's the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to appoint you to a church. And you better preach this morning. Because you ain't got but one shot. Because after you preach this morning, they're going to change the locks on the door. You never get back in that pulpit again, but preach while you're in there. If you never get another chance, preach while you got a chance. I believe I'll testify while I have a chance. I believe I'll lift my hands while I have a chance. I believe I'll praise the Lord. While I have a chance, I believe I'll cut my step. While I have a chance, may not have this chance anymore. Say yes. Say yes. Come on and clap those hands and help me give God some break. God, raise up a lay person and said, Seymour, it's all right to get put out of your church. It's all right to get locked out from your pulpit. It's all right to have doors shut in your face. Haven't you been put out? Haven't you been ostracized? Haven't you been talked about? Having friends left you, but lift your hand and tell God thank you for doors shut in my face. Thank you for them putting me out of the click. Thank you for them putting me out of the club. Say yes, say yes. Come on, help me give God some praise. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, I said he got put out. Mm. Why don't you help me with this? Look at somebody next to you and tell them, I got put out. I know you don't feel me yet, but I'm going to help you. Look at somebody else and tell them, I got put out. Well, what you mean, brother pastor? Well, you were in the womb for nine months. But when mama went in the delivery room, somebody said, push. Oh, Lord, you didn't have no bills to pay in the womb. You didn't have to go to work meet the man early in the morning in the womb but you'll never get a name until you get put out you never learn how to walk till you get put out you never grow into a man or a woman until you get 
I want to thank you for putting me out. Richard Allen got put out of St. George's, hitched the team of mules to a blacksmith shop, flew it to 60 number, where Mother Bethel is now. Why is there a Mother Bethel? Cause Richard Allen got put out while Seymour was preaching on Bonnie Bray Street. Anybody remember, we went to Bonnie Bray Street. The porch broke in. Then they went to Azusa Street. And that's where God raised up another lay person seeking for more power, seeking for the Holy Ghost. Yes, he'd been called, called to preach, called the pastor, went to Arkansas Baptist College, but he was still seeking. The more he got serious about God, the more folk backed off from him. But he left Lexington, Mississippi, and went to Los Angeles, California, found the zoos, the streets, and then went down into the basement where rank sinners are. I know I'm a pastor, but I want to start with the sinners. I want to be like a lay person. Save me all over again. Cleanse me all over again. Wash me all over again. Oh, Lord, pour out your spirit on me. Say yes. Say yes. Before Mason knew it, God has sent a wave of glory over his life from that Holy Ghost experience. Mason laid hand on O.T. Jones, senior. O.T. Jones, senior, laid hand on Ernest. Call Morris Senior. Ernest Call Morris Senior. Laid hands on me. Laid hands on you. Say yes. Say yes. Come on, help me give God some praise in here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Come on, welcome the Holy Spirit. Come on and welcome the anointing. Come on and welcome the revival. Welcome the fire. Welcome the power. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Come on and give him glory today. Thank you. Thank you. Help me to praise him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is Bishop J. Lewis Felton thanking you for joining us for the Mount Airy Kingdom Worship Experience. May you continue to partner with us as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. We love you in Jesus' name.